Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And this evening is uh, uh, being uh, brought to you um, uh, in, in, in partnership with the uh, Washington uh, Literary Center. Uh, uh, it's an event that promises to be particularly instructive, featuring Nancy Sherman talking about her new book, uh, Stoic Wisdom. Uh, a couple of brief housekeeping notes first, though. Uh, to post a question at any point, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the chat function also will be active, uh, though for comments, not questions, you know, keep those in the Q&A column. Uh, but in the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing additional copies of, of Stoic Wisdom. Uh, Nancy, a professor of philosophy at Georgetown University, is an expert in ancient and modern ethics and also has a background in psychoanalysis. Her previous half dozen works have covered such topics as Aristotle and Kant on virtue, the history of Stoicism in the military, and the impact of battle on soldiers, especially the moral bruising that can result. In Stoic wisdom, Nancy takes what to some anyway is a pretty archaic subject, uh, Stoic philosophy whose origins date back to the third century BCE. And she applies it to dealing with the challenges of today and the search for, for calm in a chaotic world. Actually, as Nancy notes at the outset of her book, Stoicism has been making a comeback, gaining fresh popularity as a source of time-honored life lessons, becoming, as Nancy says, the new Zen. It seems many of us are more in need than ever of ways of building resilience, finding inner strength, and figuring out how to live a good life. Inevitably, this recent popularization of Stoicism has led to some distortions of what the ancient practitioners intended. Nancy corrects uh, these misrepresentations while explaining which Stoic tenets and practices really are worth following. All of which makes her book, as the Washington Independent Review of Books said, a practical, readable guide for everyday living. Conversation with Nancy this evening will be Zeke Emanuel, a trained oncologist, bioethicist and leading authority on public health care, who served as a special advisor at OMB during the early years of the Obama administration when he helped shape the Affordable Care Act. He's now at the University of Pennsylvania where he chairs the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy and is a vice provost for global initiatives, providing strategic direction for Penn's global endeavors. His most recent book published last year is Which Country Has the World's Best Health Care? So uh, Nancy and Zeke, the screen is yours. Thank you, Brad. It's really a tremendous honor to be here and to be able to be in conversation uh, with uh, Professor Sherman, uh, someone I've known lo these uh, 25 years. She preceded me at the Harvard Graduate School. Um, uh, so we didn't know each other there, but when both of us were in DC, uh, came to know each other. Uh, so Nancy, um, I wanna begin in part because um, I like to call myself a, uh, a current culture moron. I know very little about current culture. It mostly goes over my head. All the uh, stock phrases and euphemisms I don't get. And so one of the things that surprised me here was all this interest in the Stoics in current culture, especially among the tech California crowd. Uh, what's the appeal of uh, people like Seneca uh, to this crowd? Why, why have we had this uh, resurgent interest in Stoicism? Well, you're not the only cultural moron. I, I start that way as well, as my family knows well. Uh, I was surprised by it as well, but here's, I think, the, the lowdown. Uh, it's Greek and Roman, and so it's Western and Western philosophy is often appropriated and misappropriated uh, as we know. So that's one interest. The second is the Stoics give you lots of techniques and know-how called in that community life hacks. Actually, my husband is a, a data science guy and uh, actually has a book on his shelf, 1991, I think about hacking. Never heard of the word life hack. So <laughs> it came into being, you know, relatively recently, but it ideas made popular by Tim Ferriss, uh, by um, 
even Jack Dorsey of, of Twitter and the like, uh, are that you can master fear, you can uh, curb your anger, and it's a new self-help. It's a newest self-help. Uh, and I guess the real thing is that those of us who study philosophy know how arcane some of the subjects are. And Brad mentioned that in the, at the intro. Seneca is very readable. He's actually my favorite of the Stoics. Epictetus is even more readable. And Marcus Aurelius is readable and humble. So, <laughs> and if you're looking for secular religion or, and you want something to quote on occasion or you really sort of want some inspiration in, in the morning to kickstart your day, but also meditations that are very different from silent retreats or ohms, but rather, or I'd say rather chatty, very chatty discourse, then the Stoics have something to offer for you. So I think that's amongst it, but it is definitely falling into the self-help category, which is its own problem in some way, I think, and something I tackle head on. I guess I should also just say that um, there's a way in which some aspects are really quite uh, prescient. And I think the life hackers kind of get it right. It's not just Silicon Valley, by the way, it's or people making gazillion dollars out there. It's people caught in, you know, in, in uh, in work cells, uh, computer wonks in a certain way, but lots of other people who have tried this and tried that and want to find a way that can give them some inspiration, you know, here and there. And some are actually are familiar with texts. They like texts or they like the inspiration that comes from very quotable bits and pieces of text. So they, they, they go there. I think the prescient part is that the Stoics despite the popularization of being stoic as being emotionless, really are probably the smartest ancient philosophers on the emotions. I mean, I'm floored by it as really an Aristotelian at heart. I think they have it every bit. I'll reveal that, that's the dirty secret. <laughs> so you're um, not a stoic yourself. So l l let me ask um, uh, what these, uh, people who are sort of tech uh, focused uh, get wrong about the Stoic philosophy? So one of the things they get wrong is thinking it's about me or that it's part of self-improvement, self-journey, um, my quest for the best life, whatever that means. Um, anyone that is, knows something about ancient ethics really knows that ancient ethics has always been focused on flourishing as a, as, as a social being. It's not go it alone grit. It's not macho self-reliance. I mean, maybe um, Emerson had that read on the Stoics. I think he probably did. Um, but that's not really what ancient philosophy, ancient ethics is about. And the Stoics, so that's one thing they get wrong, that if it's sort of a, a, a retreat inside because the outside world is so messy and that you have to be able to um, build a citadel within, then what they're getting wrong is that the Stoics were our first cosmopolitans. Uh, maybe they didn't invent the word, that's this you know, very colorful, yippy-like guy, Diogenes the Cynic, who essentially said, I'm from everywhere and nowhere. He wasn't from the polis or their little Greek city state. He was from, he was a citizen of the world. And, you know, he's sort of the Abby Hoffman of his day because he said, deface the coinage. You know, uh, um, Roman currency is a sign of convention. And so Abby Hoffman, if you, if those of you old enough to remember, <laughs> floated dollar bills down from the Wall Street gallery and stopped the stock exchange because the traders were picking up the dollars. That's kind of who Diogenes the cynic was. And so he was anti-conventional. It was street theater politics. The Stoics picked up on some of it, but most importantly, they picked up on the idea that we're, the social fabric really extends outward, you know, and it extends out to the furthest person in virtue of sharing reason. That means that we, according to even Marcus Aurelius, we have obligations to connect in ways that may be hard for us. And he says, if you've ever seen on the battlefield, uh, limbs disconnected from the trunk of a person, that's what it is when we make ourselves 
uh, separated one from the other. And we have an obligation for cooperative endeavor. And I, I think the, the, the best part of stoicism is thinking about how we connect outward. It's sort of what Kant picked up in many ways, Immanuel Kant, a, um, a rational enlightenment theorist, in thinking that we were, were members of a commonwealth, a commonwealth of rationality. And so, oh. yeah. So it, if, if one of the things that the Stoics are is, yes, there's the individual, but we can only make sense of the individual inside a context. And by the way, that communal context is not limited to the, to the very small community you come from, but is in some sense global, cosmopolitan. Um, how does that change or how does that misunderstanding of today's uh, uh, Stoics, uh, how does that manifest itself in what they take and what real Stoics would, would uh, suggest in terms of leading your life? Well, good. So one of the ways that this connectedness uh, manifests or um, uh, gives, you a sense, gives you an opportunity to connect. Well, here's one example. Very few mention this, this guy, Heracles, who sort of has an Adam Smith-like view. Adam Smith said, we're connected, if not by a cord, but by our imagination. We and our task in being a moral individual is to change places in fancy. A great phrase, bring the other into your breast. And, you know, we would say, walk in their shoes and, you, and they walk in your shoes as a way of imagining what uh, the plight of someone else is like or just what someone rather different from you are. So this guy Heracles, lesser known, has you in the center and he says, imagine concentric circles going all the way out and uses the language to furthest race, furthest tribe, all of humanity. Your job, he says, with zeal and respect, that's the words, is to bring the outermost circle back to me, to you. That's a very active engagement in trying to figure out what our social responsibilities are, what our duties are one to another, and not just how I find calm in my own life. Actually, it's a rather moral commitment. Rarely is that discussed. In fact, there's, you know, some in that community might say, you know, there's a lot of discussion of courage and a lot of discussion of grit not much discussion of justice. Well, it's all there in the ancients, but they're not picking it up. And that's, I think, it's symptomatic of the times. It's not good ethics. Here's an example. In class, just last week, we were finishing up term undergraduates and they read the very thin book, Epictetus. And, you know, my students didn't quite know what to make of it. And one student, after a whole semester of tackling Kant and John Stuart Mill and Aristotle and Plato, said, this sounds like it's about self-interest. Professor Sherman, if this is self-interest, what does it have to do with ethics? You know, I thought he nailed it in a certain way. <laughs> The pleasures of, of, of teaching. <laughs> Do you think that to some degree, the current Stoics miss this sort of cosmopolitan communal part because they're not sensitive to it? They're really interested in, as you put it, self-help and not help of the larger community? Are they just misreading what's out there? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's symptomatic of the set of interests. Some of those that turn to it want um, morning prayer of a certain sort that is, um, you know, they've come off of their own issues, breakups, divorce, discontent at the workplace, anger issues, um, uh, impulse control. I mean, the sort of things that people might go to therapy for. So this is self-therapy of a sort, popularized coaching. I mean, I've never coached. I, I bet you aren't a coach, Zeke, you know, but the stoic doctors are viewed as coaches, life coaches. And the life coach is really about me. It's not so much about have, you know, have you healed the world today? What are your obligations out there? And that, you know, for anyone that take, takes ethics seriously, that's a problem. I mean, I work with the military community a lot and stoicism is really hot there because they know about deprivation. 
um, and they want something to fortify themselves a bit in very hard times. I get that. And one of their heroes was Jim Stockdale, who had this book, Epic, you know, the handbook of, Ep of Epictetus, and he memorized it and it became his salvation. R remind people who uh, Jim was. James Stockdale, James Bond Stockdale might have been the, fa the, the clueless um, vice presidential candidate with Ross Perot, who, who very much liked um, and, ad and admired the military, but he also was a senior naval aviator um, at the t during Vietnam. And he ended up being a senior chain of command in what we now call the Hanoi Hilton, but the, the North Vietnamese prisoner of war camp for our troops. John McCain, uh, perhaps better well known, was next door to him or nearby. Stockdale had been given this little skinny book uh, at Stanford where he was a master's student. And I interviewed him several times and he said to me, what would a martini drinking, golf playing, naval aviator want with a book like that? I mean, he was quite serious, but it, he ended up memorizing it. Nights were long on the USS Ticonderoga. And he said upon being shot down in 65, I think this is, leaving the world of technology, entering the world of Epictetus. And he viewed the retreat inward as the way he could survive, but he also thought it was a way of how to strengthen himself and, and selectively say no to some of, or empower himself against the oppressor, right? Who were the North Vietnamese. That said, he once said to me when I was interviewing, he said, you know, I think I'd take it again being a POW just for the silver lining that, that was stoicism. At which point his wife, Sybil, ran into the room and she said, I don't think you should get your silver lining that way. <laughs> and then she herself was a, a force. She was the person who lobbied McNamara, Defense Secretary at the time, Robert McNamara, to bring home the POWs. So I think the you know, the inner strength aspect is important, but not everyone thinks or should think that adversity is a blessing. I mean, you're, you and I know, you're a doctor. I know there, adversity doesn't always have good outcomes, but this crowd, many who believe in stoicism do think of it as anti-fragility, a word I hate being bulletproof, becoming invincible. And that's some of the shock and awe value of stoicism. It isn't the part that I think is the healthiest. So I'm actually curious about this because one of the things that I admire about your work is that you are among uh, uh, contemporary philosophers, very engaged and maybe one of the original people engaged in thinking about the emotions and their relationship to ethics and things like that. So what role does the emotions play in a stoic uh, world perspective? That's a great question. So first, we got to separate two things. One is just their description of emotions. They are so complex. It makes Aristotle look, you know, thin. And I love Aristotle. So, and Plato too. They think there are three levels of emotions. One are sort of like Joe Ledoux's low road emotions. They're quick arousals that you can't really control. You, you, you sweat, you blanch, you have an erection, you, you know, they're starts and startles and they signal the world out there. Um, then they're just ordinary emotions. Most of us have anger, fear, uh, distress, um, joy, desire. And then there are kind of good versions of the latter where, where they're story is that you try to have a different, almost like a, a different behavior, cognitive behavior response to those emotions, to, to the ordinary emotions. If you have fear, try not to have panicky aversion. Try to make it a bit more wary or, or cautious. If you have desire that's getting out of hand, try to make the attachment not so sticky the object out there to which you're going, not so sticky. If you're enjoying something, try not to make it totally um, uh, uh, out of hand, uh, uh, somewhat manageable. So they have this way of trying prescriptively now to temper down some of the out of hand emotions so that 
if you're a progressor, that's where we all are. It's an aspirant, someone, you know, striving to be a little more in control of themselves. You're going to have a different kind of a relation to the objects of attachment and aversion than we usually have. And B, try to cognitively appraise them somewhat differently. It's not the, the insult that came to you wasn't really to you. It was about some, your view of things, not, it wasn't personal, right? You so I, I'm, I'm curious about this because um, this sort of uh, emotions within bounds or tempered emotions, not so many highs and not so many lows, you know, that sort of maybe in some areas it's good. I, I shouldn't be so mad at my brother, for example, but in other areas, like, you know, I don't fall passionately head over heels in love for my partner seems like missing out on something really deep about human experience and human life. I couldn't agree more. And so, you know, I take it with a grain of salt. Um, <laughs> here's, uh, here's one kind of uh, stoic tip that actually came up with my mother, who, uh, and you'll appreciate this, never wanted to talk about death. And, you know, here she was, 96, in a, a nursing home, and we still weren't talking about death. And so I had a feeling she was kind of afraid of it, that it was something that was untouchable. So I tempered it. I wasn't thinking stoic. I was certainly thinking more loving daughter. But now I think about it in retrospect. It's very, very stoic. <laughs> I said, you know, mom, just remind me, did we sign up for the immortality plan? Because if we signed up, it's going to be really expensive. <laughs> At which point she smiled and it became our little dance. We had this little dance. That's kind of stoic where I rephrase something pretty uh, frightening to her in a more palatable way. And of course, um, you know, extreme passion is, is wonderful. The stoics just want to give you a little bit of guidance about how to rein it in. They're particularly thinking about fear and anger. And with the fear component, I, you know, they, they realize that you're going to react very impulsively to many things in a good way. That's life threat. It's according to nature, they would say. Sometimes they say it's not so good because you're distorting. And this is where I think that they're rather interesting. Seneca says, monitor your attention, monitor your, uh, what you're assenting to. Maybe you don't get the picture right. I mean, I can think of this a little bit actually in terms of police re reactions. Many, you know, it's very hard to say how you would respond um, under life threat. But I know working with the military, they constantly are reappraising and relearning what the field looks like. So their responses are more educated um, when they're dealing with life threat. So, um, uh... I'm going to have another question or two of uh, Professor Sherman. Um, and if you are interested in uh, posing a question, please go to the question and answer section. I have one, uh, but I would like to uh, have a few others uh, to go forward. Um, but uh, I'm just going to ask a couple of more questions, and then we're going to have a little more dialogue with uh, the interest of you in the audience. And I know uh, from long experience, uh, that the uh, patrons of politics and prose are an incredibly uh, wise and intelligent uh, group of uh, uh, readers, and you always have excellent questions. So, um, Nancy, I wanted to ask another question about if I were to lead a Stoic life, how would it look? What, what are the kinds of things I would be doing that would mark me out as a modern day? Stoic or follower of Seneca or however you want to put it. Great. Um, so one of the things I think we would be, I've often thought about it. One is uh, taking really seriously the idea that there's striving, you know, that we are aspirants or whatnot. We haven't arrived, but we're, we're, we're looking, uh, looking to uh, morally um, improve ourselves. So I think that's a healthy a healthy aspect. Um, the second thing is we're really building social capital um, to use Bob Putnam's language. Um, we're, and it's not narrow. I mean, if the Stoics went out from the polis to the whole cosmos, some of it was because the Romans were conquering a lot, but otherwise they also wanted us to really think of humanity as writ large. 
that's ennobling and it takes work. Uh, the third thing is, you know, I think smart emotions are a reasonable thing. Blind emotions aren't always so great. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of my time thinking about emotions, as you said, and also um, as my children will, you know, say, you know, my emotions haven't always been great, but sometimes I've, I've learned from my mistakes. Um, and then finally, I think, uh, and this is part maybe what excites me the most, Seneca really viewed himself as a teacher. Uh, he had these letters he wrote late in life. He's a, char he's a very uh, mixed bag of a character because he was the speechwriter and a failed moral tutor, we can say, of Nero. But he was a amazing writer who really thought of himself as, uh, as a, a mentor and a tutor. But he, he also said, you know, that he wasn't bulletproof. It wasn't wasn't invincible or invincible against death. I have to say, because I'm talking to you, Zeke, you know, there are people out there in the Silicon Valley crowd, biohackers, who would like to beat death. You know, they think they've got the right, the right, the right potion. For just that. take out the word some. All of them <laughs> have that view, as far as I can tell. Right. So you can set them straight on that one. <laughs> uh, that said, there there's a way of thinking about the um, the, the, the world at large and, and Seneca as, as a teacher. And he said, I, you know, I'm in the sick bed as well as the doctor. And so if I didn't have frailty, I wouldn't know how to, how to write. And I think that's what we should sort of take away. And there's no better words than the end of Seneca's on anger. He's been going on and on about how ugly of an emotion it is. And then he says, let us cultivate humanity. So, and that means, um, the best of ourselves, often selfless, with some sacrifice, and uh, appealing to rational discourse, where emotions are cognitive. They are rationally imbued, saturated through and through. And so they're kind of corrigible some of the time. Okay. So <laughs> someone has complained that I haven't asked you to give us a, uh, uh, a simple definition of stoicism. So can you do that? Ooh, that's hard. <laughs> okay. The Stoics aren't one thing or person. There's a, you know, they go from 300 <clears throat> before the common era to around 200 common era. So you got this whole thing. The best way I could say is this. They found Stoicism is a philosophy that reacts to a problem that Aristotle left them. He left them a mess. The mess was that flourishing required virtue, but it also required some external goods friends, some wealth, uh, a, a, benevol a reasonable regime, not being imprisoned, uh, and health. That makes your good life pretty vulnerable. So how do we fortify our lives so it's a little less vulnerable? If you're a Stoic, you're always striving to have more control, but not so much that you become an island unto yourself. That's my definition. Good. Um, someone has asked here, uh, are there, are any of our world leaders, as far as you can piece it together, Stoics, like Ooh. Marcus Aurelius? We're, I don't know. I'll, I'll give you the two or three things. Uh, General Mattis always claims to have carried, or claims to have carried uh, Marcus Aurelius regularly in his rucksack, tattered copy. Um, and I think it was not for the connectedness of the world, but because Marcus really was, was humble. He, he, knew how, he knew gold effigies were going to be wheeled out in the morning, and he was trying to be less puffed up about it. Um, who else would be? Well, here's one. Uh, this is not a world leader, but someone I've often thought of. Uh, well, Queen Elizabeth, you know, everyone says uh, stiff upper lip, and so they are the... Uh, the uh, caricature, you might say, of Stoicism with a little s. Maybe a world, this is not a world leader, but someone I actually thought of a lot in writing this book was a guy I came to know named um, Hugh Thompson. He was the guy that um, stopped the Milai massacre, essentially. And he was really uh, ostracized from the army because it, he gave the order, if the GI shoot me, you shoot back. And, and he was a hunted and haunted man. He was the captain, right? He was an army, excuse me, he was, yeah, he wasn't quite, no, he wasn't quite a captain, he was a warrant officer. He, he was a helicopter guy and he, he stopped the helicopter and the guys that he was opposing were 
Lieutenant Kelly and Captain Medina and 300 breathing bodies in a ditch. He had to control his anger enough to do what he did, which was stop the helicopter, went out with only a sidearm and put himself between the GIs and these women and men and Buddhist monks that were being marched out of the, out of the huts. And yet anger, righteous indignation, moral outrage, and that the, GI, the GIs shouldn't be Nazis, which is what he eventually saw them to be. That kind of motivated him, but yet he controlled it in order to stop a massacre. He's not a world leader. He's actually, you know, I think forgotten by many and should be taught more in the schools. But I think of him as someone who did what he needed to do on principle with a little bit of the kick of moral outrage or a lot of it pushing him onward. Can't say much about public leaders. I, they're, they're an enigma to me. <laughs> I wish, you know, I wish they'd listen to me. So uh, one person asks, how would you say Stoic philosophers differ from Eastern uh, philosophy? Great. And yeah, I, great question. Especially <laughs> since you connected right at the start between Zen and Stoicism, and, and Stoicism, the in some ways popular heir to Zen. So Zen is very much, to the extent that I understand it, about um, eliminating the self to some degree, or at least minimizing it and also meditating by emptying your mind. Um, that's, and I do meditate in a Vedic, through Vedic meditation every morning. And, and it's to quiet the babble. And I've got a lot of babble going on in my head. <laughs> Stoics meditate by chatty discourse. In fact, you know, in the book I give this, um, uh, Steve Martin had a friend, Carl Weiner, many of you know, and he called Carl Weiner very late one night and said, am I disturbing you? And, and Reiner answers, no, I'm just going through, you know, a litany of all the mistakes I made during the day, which is sort of how the Stoics meditate. That's how Seneca meditates. Was I too harsh with my enslaved person? Did I push someone into the shark pool because they broke a crystal goblet? That's not how I think Easterns meditate. So they're both about calm and tranquility by getting rid of some of the disabling emotions, but in very different ways. So um, someone has a very interesting and somewhat complex question. And so I'm going to try to summarize it and I hope I do it fairness. He says, you know, uh, the Stoics seem to connect self-interest and connection with others and they don't see a tension there or a contradiction. Um, and he says, and I'm quoting here, their ethics are connected with their conception of an ordered universe. I'm not sure we can treat, retrieve that kind of confidence unless we are committed to a religious outlook. Do you think that fundamentally there's a religious view underlying the Stoic view? And that's partially maybe the appeal, as you pointed out at the start, a sort of uh, a secular religion might be an element of the appeal to the Jack Dorseys of this world. Uh, yeah, the sort of secular religion is partly out there. Look, um, Judeo-Christianity, much less so the other um, Abrahamic religion, Islam, I don't think absorbed it, but Judeo-Christianity you know, Judeo -Christianity absorbed a lot of uh, Stoicism. They were hanging out at the same time. Philo is quoting stuff when he, uh, 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 Stoics, when he talks about Abraham going, to going to cry at Sarah's grave, but he just goes, he doesn't cry. Sarah laughs uh, when she's told she gives birth at a hundred. She doesn't really laugh. She just sort of laughs, a nervous laugh. So some of, and, and the whole idea of we're children of God, we're all in the universe together, we're connected. That is very familiar because it was absorbed into the major religions. Law of nature, the idea of an ordered universe, that is a Stoic idea that gets absorbed by Aquinas, by later philosophers, Pufendorf, Grotius, and many other who study um, the ideas about law of nature as a way of ordering it. It gets absorbed by Kant, who is very, you know, it was very popularized, a whole idea that you could have a, 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 a the, the law that you give yourself is really a law of nature. It's a universal law of nature. That's straight out of the Stoics. And it's, 
so we've absorbed, and, the, and Kant was very important in creating this, you know, creating a republic in some ways. I mean, most people read them and Jefferson and Washington certainly were reading these guys. It was bedtime reading. It was easy stuff to read. So it's in the air and uh, many people find religion in all different ways, but they also find psychotherapy in different ways. I should say too, you know, Freud was getting a lot of therapy from ancient Greek Roman philosophy, know thyself, examine a tripartite soul, the psyche of superego, ego, id, you know, that's right out of Plato. So if we see some of the similarity in our current contemporary religion or psychotherapy, it's in part because, um, you know, we, we have absorbed a lot of Greco-Roman philosophy. That's a plea to not close classics departments. <laughs> Howard or other places, I've been getting um, messages today about plead with people not to close those departments. <laughs> um, so uh, someone asks, um, would you consider the Stoics to be ancient cognitive behavioral therapists? Ah, so that's, uh, it's picked up by Ellis and Beck who were the founders of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. And they were, moved by the idea that it's that what affects you is not out there, but your judgment about what's out there. And as I said before, they do have these remarkable ideas about not just, you know, there's one judgment, how you see the thing out there. And then the second one, how you react. So you might see it as a loss out there. Cicero lost his wife, his daughter in childbirth. And he said, it was a great loss. I'm not gonna give that one up, but I might give up the judgment that I should cry you know, for seven months, he had a hard time actually. And, and he left the, left the forum, uh, Caesar was after him and he was up in the Tusculan Hills. So yes, there are elements. I don't know if, uh, if I would call them, you know, straight up CBT therapists, but there's certainly a lineage there. And um, part of, I, as I say, the complexity and interest in the Stoics from my point of view is because they're very, very thoughtful about um, all the layered aspects of emotions from behavioral to cognitive judgments to just how you perceive the world and have quick reactions. Um, someone asked, uh, I think a, an interesting question, which is the similarities and differences between uh, stoicism and uh, sort of uh, a word you use in a sort of conception that's out there, you know, the importance of grit, resilience, mm -hmm. um, and those things. And uh, I, is, is this just, you know, resilience in another language or is it because are, are the people drawn to resilience uh, also drawn to stoicism? Is there sort of an affinity I, there yeah. or is there an important distinction? I think there's some distinction. So resilience, as you know, is a very a popular term and it's, and it's a, a term that we've latched onto, especially this year in a, a hard, hard year of isolation and, um, and loss. Um, and, it's a, and it's important um, in the military community um, uh, and, and there were massive programs um, um, sort of modeled on Marty Seligman's work um, in positive psychology and resilience. Grit, if it's An uh, Angela Duckworth, I think is her name, um, is not what I think of as, as the Stoics' um, strongest point. Um, Grit is typically, um, uh, here's, here's what a military guy would say, suck it up and truck on, embrace the suck, which is very inelegant language, but used all the time. Meaning that there's no deprivation that can undo you, or you will always grow from deprivation. That's just false. And if it all, if grit also means you go it alone, sort of a solo act, then it's wrong. Most current um, studies of resilience understand the, especially among children, the, the critical role of social supports strong families, you know, ways in which you can reach out to others to be able to be bolstered. So that is an aspect that I think is suppressed in modern stoicism, but is there in the ancients, that we are, you know, connected and we're members of cooperative communities. And if you cut that off from us, we kind of lose our 
lose our um, ability to go on. Function is how Marcus Aurelius puts it. So um, what, what is the Stoic view of family? Um, is, it, uh, is there a rich role for family uh, or is it sort of pot, part of this larger cosmopolitan whole, one, one element of this sort of cosmopolitan commitments I make? I think it's part, it's that, and it's you know the the closer, it's easier. But they some of the Stoics, Zeno, I must have been reading Plato's Republic. We don't have much left, but he sort of has this idea that you call everyone of the same age mother, you know, if she's if a woman, and everyone in the same age in order to create community. You know, a, a, a view many have debunked is not particularly healthy. It, or Aristotle debunks it the best way. It's watery friendship. It's water, It's a watery mother. <laughs> It might have worked in kibbutzes. I'm not sure. I'm not a, a, a student of kibbutzim. Um, the there's a terrible um, sort of a shock and awe quote that I, I give in class often. It's it's in Epictetus's little handbook, and it says, you know, kiss your and it's from an, an Exagoras, a pre-Socratic. Kiss your child goodbye in the morning as if it were the last time. When my students read this, I think they think that. Um, you know, I'm crazy or that their parents are going to disown them or they're going to go into an orphanage or they'll never be able to go home again. And um, that is one of these pre-rehearsal uh, life hacks or techniques. Imagine, as I was trying to get my mother to do, just imagine, dwell in the future is how the Stoics put it a bit. Anticipate, pre-rehearse. Some of, so the family is, is, a, is a place where there can be vulnerability, obviously. You know, we having a child predecease you, having, you know, uh, suffering loss, all these make you vulnerable. And so the Stoics try to give you some buffer between yourself and loss, but they don't disown the family. And the, the, the texts that we have are not well restored, but there are some versions of it. I will just say this, the pre predecessors of the Stoics and the Cynics, who I say were very colorful, were into all sorts of uh, strange arrangements, you know, intercourse in the streets, cross-dressing, um, living in earthen tubs in the middle of the, of the street and whatnot, you know. So they were, um, go back to nature is what <laughs> was their idea and whatever you can do to be anti-conventional in, a, in a, uh, a, a, a kind of polemical way was their thing. So. If, Family's there, but it's a more complicated story. So is it more like a community hippie type approach? A little bit. I think that's a way of putting it. Yeah, to the degree that we know what the Earl, the, the founder Zeno was writing and that sort of kind of reconstruction story. Um, so there are a couple of people who probably know Eastern philosophy, not probably, definitely know Eastern philosophy <laughs> better than I do, who uh, talk about uh, Stoicism closer to Confucianism than to Zen. I'm going to have to pass on that because they know more about Confucianism than I know about, <laughs> <laughs> about it. I'm sorry. I, I wish I knew more. Um, th there's a very interesting question here be uh, asking you for your view on the relationship between Stoicism and democracy. Are these anti-democrats or are these uh, pro-democrats, as it were, or is, are they, that's not a very important category for them? Yeah, not an important category. Um, I mean, it's, it, they're not really writing political tracts, they're writing more ethical tracts and, um, you know, tracts for uh, how to, how to conduct yourself well vis-a-vis -vis others in more interpersonal ways than, uh, than the political ways per se. So here's a, just an example that I, it gets lost in the modern conversation. I think it's, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Um, Seneca writes these remarkable tracks on, I think, on um, beneficence, on benefactions. Um, and Cicero sort of picks up on some of that. Cicero's on duties has a lot of that stuff. Um, he's not a Stoic, but he travels with them. And part of, and it's about what we owe each other. And um, so it's not political, but it's social. You know, it's sort of picking up on the theme that we're social animals. And the idea is that uh, we we should engage regularly in the back and forth of 
gift giving, you know, they're thinking of, uh, uh, of benefactions as material, but it's also actually emotional expression. So it's, again, it's sort of at the interpersonal transactional level. But what's fascinating is the emphasis on emotional expression. Giving a gift with a furrowed brow is like giving bread with stones in it, says Seneca. Showing gratitude with a scowl is not it, it, on your face is no gratitude at all. Now, does that sound stoic? It doesn't, you know, it's not the stoicism that's got popularized. It's not stiff upper lip, pull your socks up, repress your emotions, decorum requires, um, a, you know, a, a, um, a little sign of expressive and emotional expressiveness. It, it's rather, it's interesting in that regard. So I, so it, less political, more social, and highly interpersonal with the attitudes of sort of know who your audience is as well, which is really interesting. So the idea, one is it, it's like playing ball, they say. If you toss the ball too high or too low, you're not looking at the audience you know, that you're trying to reach. So it's sort of um, very much, look at what the uptake is in the way in which you give your, um, your uh, your gift or your emotional gift. Um, there's an interesting question here uh, that goes to the heart of uh, what motivated the Stoics. And it, it uh, the person asks, uh, does Seneca's birth in Spain away from uh, the center in uh, uh, Greece or Rome, uh, does that play a critical role in his sort of cosmopolitanism and his broader Stoicism? Great question. I don't know that it does. Um, you know, maybe he was he was brought there. You know, through an uncle or an aunt to that, uh, and and then he was banished early on. So he, he was not. You know, he, he didn't stay there very long. He was banished to Corsica. Corsica is then was not the Corsica now. It's not the the um, you know a scuba diver. Uh, Heaven and beach heaven, uh, new uh, the Riviera, the Riviera. <laughs> um, it was really desolate, and so he's. And, and it was only because his mother Agrippina, uh, fought, who was married to Claudius, thought that he, he might make a great speechwriter for her prince son called Nero, that he was able to get out of Corsica. So he did spend a lot of time as a, you know, as a, in uh, the farther, farther lands, but much of his formative years were actually in a pretty opulent court um, where he had to deal with, you know, I'd say the struggles he dealt with were more his inner notion that abstinence was not a bad thing and opulence was pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> and also fear what comes around goes, you know, what, what goes around comes, what comes around goes around. He eventually was forced to commit suicide on the grounds that he had conspired against Nero, he, you know, the Pisonian conspiracy. So I'd say he was more, you know, politics, the politics of the period were more what motivated him in his mature years than anything else. It was also, we shouldn't forget, he was, a, he was a tragedian. He wrote, I think, great tragedies. There's some scholarly controversy as to whether they're in his pen or not. But I think Hercules Rages, um, the Trojan women are really quite amazing and terrific um, ways of thinking about, um, well, Hercules, he thinks of his real courage is about staying his anger. He wants to commit suicide because he killed his family um, when he was blinded by Juno. And, and the father says, um, stay, use your, or it's a friend, use your heroic courage to show yourself self-mercy. You know that, is that a stoic? It is, you know, it's Seneca showing you the other side of, of a complex, um, of, of complex moral psyche. Um, great. Uh, so, I'm going to switch at the end. And by the way, if you have a last question or two, please put it in the Q&A section. Um, so uh, one of the very first questions wanted to ask, why did you write this book? And how much um, 
of an influence, uh, if you will, was your time as a uh, uh, professor at the Naval Academy um, in shaping your either interest in Stoicism or your need to get Sto uh, Stoicism right for the modern world? Great. Um, I hadn't taught Stoicism until I got to the Naval Academy in the mid 90s. I was brought there um, because of a, a cheating scandal, a massive cheating scandal, and I was asked to teach ethics. And so I, I taught a, what I thought was a pretty standard ethics course, but with lots of case studies. In fact, I think I had you out there. At yes, point, you did. A, a long time ago, Zeke. And it was when we got to the Stoics, the ship had arrived, you know, we were home, this was their philosophy. But I realized it wasn't always a healthy one. You know, there was so much suck it up and truck on, don't ever talk about these feelings. Uh, people were at that time just flying over a place called the Basra Road, it was the first Gulf War. I had aviators that were coming home. I had uh, Marine colonels who had been in, in Vietnam um, and, you know, Sink Packs, head of the Pacific, uh, commander in chief of the Pacific, who really couldn't talk about any of these issues. And I thought if stoicism was about that, then we, we were producing a, 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 a cadre, a, an armed forces that would be really at risk for more post-traumatic stress. Um, we were not yet at war, the wars, the, the, the endless wars Iraq, Afghanistan came later after my time. So it was going back to the texts that I found, I have to say so much enlightenment. I really sort of fell in love with them. I fell in love with them in a complex way. You know, I, they, they're, they're less scholarly. Some of them are less scholarly, some are more scholarly. Um, but I also thought I need, need to sort of get the word out. And then much, much, much later, I would be on talk shows um, with individuals and the theme that came up over and over was, it's not the thing out there, it's your estimate of it. It's what you make of it. And I thought this is a retreat inward. And if it's accept and acquiesce, then it's not only unhealthy, it's not a way I wanna live in the world, certainly. And it's not a way I wanna teach my students to live in the world. Um, and so I, wanted to you know, plunge into the texts to see if there were ways of understanding some of their uh, psychological strategies and their epistemological strategies for how we you know, perceive the world, uh, make judgments. So it's philosophy of mind and the like um, in a way that give us the kind of uh, opening for a, a more enlightened way of not just accepting the world as we find it, but changing it when we have to, which certainly is, I think, the way we many of us find ourselves in the world these days. So it, if I've got you right, part of your motivation was that this notion of stoicism equals stiff upper lip and uh, was wrong and you wanted to provide the um, subtle corrective to it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, much more complicated story about how you do about pres a prescriptive story about your emotions. Yeah. And much more uh, complex story about uh, your, your place in the world. So it isn't uh, a place of retreat and inner citadel stuff. Um, why, why do you think this sort of stoicism equals stiff upper lip? How old is that and where did it get started? That's in? a great idea. You know, I was wondering, it's very Victorian, that, that I know. And how, who the Victorians were reading, I mean, I presume they were reading Seneca, you know, and they were reading Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus. And you can pick up that strand. Every interesting text has many strands. It's not the only one. They were certainly not reading... What's the theory of emotions? You know, no. And they were reading Cicero. So they were reading a lot on Roman decorum. And <laughs> Roman decorum, you know, is pretty, it gives you prescriptions for what you do at a funeral. And, you know, should you grieve? And how many tears can you shed? Only this many. And they shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't be forced. Or you shouldn't put on a show. I think that's, you know, the deal that they were um, absorbing a lot of that you know, I don't know, I wish I was a student of Victorian culture because <laughs> it must be deep 
uh, Lee um, mixing with study of the classics, I presume, a certain study, you know, at Oxbridge and the like of the classics, and it kind of got absorbed in a narrow way. We don't have it quite to the same degree, that is, we, we uh, in the colony here. Ah. <laughs> so I know that you, you, you've just finished this marvelous book, um, and uh, I, I don't know about you, but I go into a sort of uh, a refractory period after I finish a book. It takes me another year to do something long. Um, but what are you thinking about as a follow-on to Stoic Wisdom? I was just thinking the other day, with a bit of a sort of postpartum depression here, <laughs> that I was thinking, so the, the Stoics go, meet me at the academy or something like that. The Stoics uh, go to the academy and have a chat with Aristotle. Something to that effect. Um, you know, what are the modern, the modern Stoics, many have ne don't really know anything about Aristotle. And you know he's hard, he's a harder nut to crack, but not that hard. So something to that degree, something about the Stoics, you know, meet a peripatetic. A Stoic walks into a bar, you know, or, well, I don't know. <laughs> so, something like that. <laughs> but it is, I mean, if that is, you know, the, if there is one thing about Aristotle, is he's got a view of everything. There's nothing left out, and uh, so it's a much yes. more holistic. Uh, comprehensive view, and very few philosophers have been able to achieve such a comprehensive view in, in history. Yes, he studied mollusks. Uh, you know, he was a marine biologist and also um, wrote rhetoric, you know, wrote about rhetoric, poetics. Uh, you know, he was massive, a systematizer. But you don't have to, you know, study all of that to carve out a piece that could be in an in interesting conversation, I think, with uh, the Stoics. He also, I mean, some of the metaphysics just is so clear. You need to, rubber has to meet, meet the road. You don't possess virtue, you have to actualize it. And you have to do your part in the world to make, you know, to, to, to uh, be empowered and to uh, uh, act as well as you can given the circumstances. So it's an interesting an interesting project, I think, but I haven't got there yet. You know, I'm. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting if I, if I could just conclude, first of all, this is for those of you who haven't read it yet or haven't even bought it first, you have to buy it. And second of all, you should definitely read it. it it's incredibly well written. And um, I won't, don't want to say easy to read in, in some pejorative sense, like it's a pulp novel, but it is incredibly lucidly written. So it's not confusing, um, but it is a connection between the Stoics and Aristotle, um, that uh, what's really important is being in the world um, and actually not, um, this is not a, these are not philosophies, despite the, maybe the, the, the common view, these are not philosophies of retreat from the world. It's how you deal with the world that they're really interested in and how you manifest um, virtues. Now their conception of virtues may be different. And Maybe that's how we best understand Professor Nancy Sherman's approach to the world. You have to be in the world. You can't be out of the world. And she's going to try to help you understand the best ways of being in the world. Is that fair, Nancy? Oh, I think that's absolutely fair. Engaged in the world, um, actualizing your best um, uh, and trying best to uh, deal with circumstances as they come. Thank you. Great. So, and now we turn it back to you, Brad. A great moderating, Zeke um, and Nancy. Uh, you sure make a compelling case about the continued relevance of the Stoics more than 2,000 years later. And I'm, I'm with you. Keep those classics depart departments going, you know. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. And, go and going forward, I'm certainly going to be more careful now and hopefully more correct when using the term Stoic. Uh, to everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. A reminder that in the chat column, you can find a link for purchasing copies of Stoic Wisdom. Uh, and we do have autographed copies at, at Politics and Prose for you. Uh, from all of us here at PNP uh, and from the Washington Literary, uh, Literacy Center, stay well and well read. Thank you.